Okay, so we, this is the EWAS and breakout session. That's our logo. This is the first time we have shown the logo. Please remember it um, if you want to take photos. We don't have time for that. Okay, thank you all for coming. This is all the content we're going to have here. So I'm going to start with some kind of intro, high-level intro and what WASM is, et cetera. Um, and then we dive a bit deeper into um, the tooling we have, the languages we have. Um, we, after that, we go into this really hardcore part of EVMC. And EVMC is like a connection layer between VMs and clients. Um, so if you are a client in implementer, you should definitely watch that. Um, also, Pavel is going to deep dive a bit more into the interfaces. That's the EI, uh, and that's the way to write contracts in EWASM. And then the most important part is the testnet. So hopefully, we're going to have a demo here, and we're going to give you a glimpse how to use the testnet, which is already live. Is this still good? OK. Um, so we planned this part to be roughly like 40 minutes. And it's really strict in length and time, so we don't have time during those to have questions. But we did reserve a time, like a 10-minute slot, after these uh, introductory parts to have a longer Q&A section. So please keep your questions to that point. Um, then depending on you know, how tired people are, we can take like a five-minute break, or we can go even deeper with the second block. Um, in the second block, it's going to be a lot of research questions and all the really interesting things are uh, going to happen there. Um, and lastly, if we still have time, we're going to have a QA uh, part after that. OK, so about EWASM itself, it's just the introduction. And my name is Alex, or Axic on GitHub. That's how more people know me. Um, I've been working on EWASM for a while, and I also work on Solidity language design and the compiler. But first, let's just take a step back. And this is just really just a high level goal and vision. Uh, we want to talk a bit about. So today, we still say that we are in a Web 3.0 world, but I don't think we are in a Web 3.0 world yet. We're kind of like in a 2.5 stage. And at this stage, we write smart contracts in a language. We write some kind of presentation and a client-side code, like the front end. And these are done independently of each other. And then they are also independently deployed, and nobody Nobody has like any connection between these. And usually, the person working on the contract versus the person, person working on the front end is a different guy or different girl. And they have maybe don't have too much connection between the two parts. So it's, it's not really integrated. But I think in Web3, all of this should be way more seamless than it is today. And I think that this is like an idea how this could look like. Um, so basically, if you look at this, this would be like the DAP from, from the front end on. Okay? And there's one single part called the transfer function, which is the only part which requires consensus. Um, so I have marked that with consensus. Um, and if you consider this screen, then if you have this in an IDE or whatever, the, at deployment time, all the compiler and everything will know that this is the only part which requires consensus, that's the only part which is going to get to the blockchain, and everything else stays outside. The benefits we have here is you see all the data and everything in, in one block. You don't have to make these decisions, you know, where, where is like the consensus level data, where is like the, the front end data, and hopefully it will be a much easier decision to see, you know, what belongs where, because right now we do a lot of duplication. And I think WebAssembly can help a lot in this. There are these couple of tools which try to achieve the same thing. Uh, Victor Maya made a presentation about uh, uh, Luna, I think Luna is the name, uh, which has similar goals, uh, but we try to, to get to there from a different angle. Now, this is just like a high-level you know, future vision, um, but what we are focusing here today on is only the consensus layer, and how do we get WebAssembly into that consensus layer? So what is WASM? WASM is a executable binary format designed for the web. Um, it is designed to be highly performant. It really models a regular computer. Um, and basically, if we take a step back how WebAssembly came into existence, uh, it starts with the web itself. Uh, so we had JavaScript first to, to create you know, any kind of code, uh, which evolved into Web 2.0 with a way more JavaScript. Um, and then people started to use other tools like Mscripten to compile non-JavaScript code into JavaScript. 
Um, and that was quite slow, because JavaScript wasn't designed for this. Um, so there was this other step called ASMGS, uh, which the, the JavaScript engines could detect certain patterns, which are ASMGS patterns, and optimize those. Um, now, we can optimize this even more by introducing WebAssembly. We don't need these special patterns. So that's, that's, where, that's the reason WebAssembly came into existence, uh, to improve the web. Um, as a result, WebAssembly itself is designed to support a lot of languages. Uh, it is really low level, and there are a lot of languages supporting it. Um, there's this awesome Wasm Langs repo, which lists, I think, pretty much all of them. There are like 28 today, but with various, um, you know, various level of integration. Um, C and Rust would be the best ones today, um, but Go, Haskell, and Assembly Script are also usable. Um, because it originates from the web, it is supported by all major browsers. Um, but ourselves, we're not focusing on the web right now. We are only focusing about the consensus layer. And in a consensus layer, we don't want to use any of the web engines. And we are lucky because there are a lot of other Wasm implementations. We don't have to use web browsers to run Wasm. Um, there are a couple of implementations in C. There's an implementation in Rust by Parity. There's an implementation in Go. Um, so we don't have to rely on all this browser-specific toolkit. So wait, it, it kind of sounds like Java and JVM, right? Um, it is kind of, but it, it isn't fully. One main difference is, is Java wasn't designed for the web. It was designed before the web. And it was tightly coupled with the language, with Java itself. So as a result, it really had high-level features. Uh, it didn't have like a low-level low abstraction. It has these high-level features. Uh, which tightly couple it with Java as a language. Now, we don't, have, we don't have any of these in Wasm, but Wasm is designed to be extensible. So Wasm can actually turn into what the JVM is doing. So one quick example, example I want to give you here is garbage collection. Um, today, there's like no Wasm-level support for garbage collection. And that means if you compile a language which requires garbage collection, all this garbage collection helper code is going to be in the output. As a result, it will be big and it will be slow. Uh, but since Wasm is designed to be extensible, and anybody can propose extensions to it, there are proposals to add lang um, you know, Wasm-level support for garbage collection. So maybe that will happen. Uh, and maybe we get closer to all these features Java has. But we, at the consensus layer, are not forced to take these new features. We can stay with the core level of functionality we have today. OK, let's talk a tiny bit about the EVM itself. Uh, EVM had different design uh, rules and di different goals when it was designed. Um, it is really focusing on cryptography. Um, it doesn't really model a regular computer. I, I believe EVM really has its origins in Bitcoin script which is only focused on cryptography. And you know, public keys, hashing, all of that is slow. And we don't really need a lot of these things. Um, I think the reason EVM is kind of slow could be summarizing these two points. Uh, it is 256-bit focused. Um, so that means all the instructions handle data with 256-bit precision. We do calculations with 256-bit precision. And we don't need that in most of the time. It also makes this high and low-level features, which you know, probably is not a good idea. Now, I don't want to go too deep into EVM here, but we're going to have, after this two-hour session, we're going to have a panel on EVM. So I encourage you guys to stay for that and learn more about the EVM, um, you know, the past, present, and future of the EVM. But the EVM itself does have one big benefit. It is kind of small, kind of easy to implement, and easy to comprehend. Um, a single person can easily write an EVM interpreter and grasp the, the entire EVM uh, you know, specification. I think the same kind of applies to Wasm, but the Wasm specification is a proper specification. So it is long, and it is extensive, and explains every single edge case. There's no such specification for the EVM. So if you look at the EVM spec, it looks small and simple. But I don't think they, they differ that much. Uh, Paul is going to talk way more about this in the second part of the um, this session. OK, finally, we reached eWASM. So what is eWASM? Uh, we are trying to marry WASM and Ethereum together. But eWASM is really just WASM. We didn't have to change anything in it. And that's the beauty of 
the design of extensibility it has. Um, so basically, the extensibility we have to add here is we have to expose the Ethereum state access and modification and access features into WebAssembly. And that can be done without changing WebAssembly, because WebAssembly is designed to have a way to import external calls, and we're exposing all these features as external calls to the WASM bytecode. That being said, we don't want like regular WASM bytecode to be deployed. Uh, we do want to verify that the bytecode complies to certain rules we want to enforce. The good news is, though, that you can use a regular compiler which supports WASM, and you can compile the code with that. You don't need any change there. Um, and most of the time, you don't even need any kind of post-processing. Uh, but we do have to ensure that nothing goes wrong in a, a consensus setting in a blockchain. So we have this verification step. When somebody is supplying, deploying uh, WASM bytecode, uh, we run it through another contract, which we call the Sentinel contract. And this contract is looking up certain features which shouldn't be used in WASM bytecode. So one feature which always comes up, and which is the major one we have to restrict, is floating point numbers. We cannot deal with floating point numbers uh, right now in, in a consensus setting. Um, so we just reject any contract which uses floating point. Um, but in most of the languages, you don't have to use floating point anyway uh, for contracts, so this is not a problem. The other big part we have to do during this deployment process is to inject metering into WebAssembly. Uh, the reason for that is we don't want to have specific WASM VMs which do runtime metering. We still want to use um, you know, generic WASM VMs, or at least have the ability to use generic WASM VMs. That being said, I do believe that we have to have specific WASM VM implementations in our nodes, which you know, are really designed to, to work in this environment. But they're still compatible with the WASM bytecode. Okay, some of the high-level design goals we have followed are it's really just to have an extensible foundation for code execution. And WASM is kind of like a blueprint for um, computational, um, you know, describing computation. So you can take this WASM blueprint and you can translate it to local machine code. That, that's how it's designed. Um, so I think it's a really good foundation uh, for this. We're also trying to tap into a way bigger ecosystem here, uh, into more languages, but more, um, more importantly, a lot of more tooling, uh, especially regarding security, analysis, auditing, etc. And there's this point of reducing complexity in Ethereum, and how if we are introducing this kind of more complicated thing, at least some people claim it's kind of more complicated, um, but there are ways to reduce the complexity in Ethereum by having WASM. So one example here I want to highlight is precompiles. So today with precompiles, every single client has to implement precompiles themselves. Uh, with Wasm, you could just supply a single implementation of this precompile in Wasm itself and everything in each of the clients. So that's you know less code to be written. Um, but one really interesting thing which came up before DEF CON at the Swarm Summit, um, Jules from the Light, the Light Client Protocol. What does LES stand for? But that's the Light Ethereum. Whatever. Uh, but he's the light client protocol person. He's designing the entire light client protocol for Ethereum. And he came up with this idea to use Wasm in there. The problem he's facing is uh, in the light client protocol, you have to make, say, you make one query to get like a hash, and then you receive more data, and then you have to make subsequent queries. So it, it you know, bubbles up into a lot of queries. So what you could do is submit a computation in Wasm. To the node, the node executes that computation and gives you back all the results. So you don't need all this data exchange. You can get the node to uh, get you the data you need exactly. So I think that's really interesting uh, you know, direction we could go. But lastly, a really important point is with Wasm, we do get a better interaction uh, with other blockchains. So I'm going to expand on those a bit later. Um, so with the languages itself, we are tapping into a bigger pool of languages. That being said, we still want to support Solidity. So the Solidity team is working on having Wasm output, and hopefully that's going to happen early, mid next year. No commitments here, though. Um, but today, we already have a lot of the tooling for Wasm in Rust, because Rust is like the, the most mature uh, language to have tooling for Wasm. Um, but there's this last thing, which we're also going to touch on today, is assembly script. 
uh, which is a language similar to JavaScript. And it is, um, we are working on a framework in AssemblyScript to write contracts uh, in. So it's, it's, it really looks like JavaScript. It is easy to use and is compiling to Iwasm. Um, just a few notes about other blockchains. Uh, there are a lot of other blockchains using or considering Wasm. And if we also do use Wasm, we're going to have way more options to, to have code Sorry, to have code shared between all of them. So I think that's super exciting. OK, just two more things to mention. Because we haven't really mentioned like backwards compatibility. Um, so we have this tool called RuneVM or RunEVM, which is an EVM interpreter compiled to eWASM. And you can use this in an entirely WASM-only client. And you can run EVM bytecode on this WASM-only client. Uh, why EVM is a similar tool? But instead of having an interpreter, it is compiling uh, EVM to Wasm bytecode. Now, these are early prototypes. So if anybody's interested in working on these really cool projects, uh, please talk to us. Um, so the next steps we have now is we are launching a testnet. And then we are trying to get all of this into the mainnet. But we cannot do that at once. Uh, so we are trying to get a subset of pre-compile only support into the mainnet. And then have the entirety of eWasm in the mainnet. Um, even though it's said like a goal, goal number four, uh, I think Shasper slash E2.0 slash certainty work going to happen parallel to all of this. Um, so that was the intro. Please check the spec and all the code we have. Join Gitter, uh, create dubs, and talk to us. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't sort of do an intro in the beginning. That was Alex Bergsassi. He's our team lead. One more round of applause for Alex. <laughs> All right, up next, I think we're going to do demos of some of the language tooling that we've built. Um, Paul, are you up first? Um, obviously, one of the nice things we get with the eWASM toolchain is the ability to develop smart contracts in a whole host of different programming languages. Alex, a moment ago, mentioned some of them. These include Rust, C, C++, AssemblyScript. You're gonna, we're going to do quick demos of uh, two or three of these right now. And as a first um, framework for doing that, we created, Alex created something called the WRC20 challenge. The W refers to WASM. And it was just a, a challenge that we put out there a few months ago to build a simple ERC20 style contract, like a token contract, using the various languages. We've had implementations done in eight or nine languages so far. Um, I think you can find this in our GitHub repository, github.com uh, GitHub slash uwasm, if you're interested in contributing one. And Paul's going to do C, C++, right? Yes. Do you, do you need a mic? Uh, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great. Uh, yeah, so we had this WRC20 challenge uh, to implement ERC20. And I wanted to implement it in C and C++. So I think most uh, engineers, uh, many engineers, learn C as an undergrad. And C++, C++ is, is ubiquitous. And uh, people are talking about these languages like Rust and uh, AssemblyScript. But I'm sort of naive, and I am stuck in my ways. And I like C and C++. So that's why I wrote it in C or C++. Um, so anyway, I found some. Uh, Anyway, this is just the gist of, of the code. Uh, uh, boy, I don't know. Uh, some reverse byte stuff, and I wasn't really, I don't know what to really say. We, we have some functions that we were to implement, and I implemented them. And this is how, <laughs> it's, it's like, I know this is like, you know, uh, uh, a lot to just, you know, I don't know how I'm supposed to explain this in five minutes. But anyway. <laughs> Anyway, this is the smart contract in C, and C, or it's similar for C++. And we're hoping that you know, uh, if we're going to onboard you know hundreds of thousands, millions of people, you know, a lot of C and C++ programmers uh, might want to write smart contracts too. So uh, maybe we should give them the tools to do it, and uh, some make stuff. So I'm using this uh, uh, some LLVM backend, but uh, there are some problems. The toolings are the tools aren't ready yet. Uh, but there are some people writing tools uh, 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 to do this kind of thing. Lane, can you uh, come? And also, I wanted to show another implementation of WRC20. I'm not a Mac person, that's why. Oh, boy. <laughs> Give me that one. OK, so if you don't 
so C is one option, C++ is one option, but if you want to handwrite it in, in uh, WebAssembly, you can do this. So this is my uh, version, and I think this is the shortest version of the WRC20, uh, the most efficient one, and if you're going to use it, this might be, be the best one. It's like 180 lines of WebAssembly code. No, but uh, I did have test cases, and it passed the test cases. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe, I don't know, maybe you won't trust it, but uh, I don't know, 180 lines isn't, beg your pardon? Oh, okay, Wayne. Oh, yeah, so let me try to pull this up for you guys. If you go to, right, so we have a WRC20 examples repository here. It's uh, uwasm slash WRC20 examples. Um, and uh, right now there's an issue open, and you can see, I think most of them are listed here. So we have Rust, we have Assembly script, which I'll show you in a sec. We have NIM, which is very cool. C, C++, handwritten WebAssembly. Um, I think there may be a couple of others as well. All right, is that, are you, are you good? Cool. Thanks, Paul. All right, I'm going to show you guys uh, what the assembly script one looks like now. So I initially came up with a really clever name for this talk, smart contracts in JavaScript. No, really, almost. Uh, let, me, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so first, what is WebAssembly, sorry, what is AssemblyScript? So AssemblyScript is a subset of TypeScript, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, right? Type, TypeScript is a strictly typed superset of JavaScript, and types are good for a whole host of reasons. We believe they produce better code. Um, it's a better programming paradigm, and in particular, in sort of mission-critical applications like we're writing on Ethereum, um, we think that the types go a long way to, uh, to like I said, writing better, more secure, uh, better performant code as well. Uh, and on top of all that, of course, WebAssembly itself is strictly typed. So um, yeah, so, so there's a really cool project called AssemblyScript, which allows you to write um, in a language which looks and feels a lot like JavaScript, or of course TypeScript if you've used it, and compile that down to WebAssembly. Um, and so sort of from my perspective, I have nothing against domain-specific languages like Solidity and Viper and all the other great ones, I think that um, they're very important. They've gotten us quite far, and they'll sort of have a, a role in the Ethereum ecosystem for some time to come. However, my personal sort of goal for Ethereum is I want to see millions of people developing applications on Ethereum. And personally, I don't believe that way, the way we get there is, uh, is by requiring people to learn brand new programming languages and brand new programming paradigms from scratch, right? Let me just go over this point one more time because I think it's important. There's a huge advantage to doing that, right? If you're writing mission critical code, if you're writing a piece of wallet software, by all means, do it in Solidity, do it in Viper, learn EVM, um, get that code audited, right? I don't want that process to change. But if you're building something for fun, right? If you're building a toy, if you're hacking at a hackathon, I really think that having something that, as I said, looks and feels like JavaScript and uses existing JavaScript tooling, tools like NVM and Yarn, et cetera, and NPM, et cetera, um, is, will go a long way towards, towards opening the Ethereum ecosystem to millions of developers who are very familiar with those tools. So that's my personal motivation for working on AssemblyScript. Um, so I'm just going to, this is, as um, Paul said a moment ago, this is kind of a lightning talk. I'm just going to super quickly show you kind of what this looks like. And the first thing I'm going to show you here <laughs> is my WRC20 example code, so this works. This is, this is assembly script, it's valid, it compiles, it runs. Uh, we've deployed it on the test net. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if that font size is not super large. I don't think I can easily increase it, but hopefully you guys can get a sense of this. You know, it's kind of funny, right? It looks sort of like JavaScript. It kind of has JavaScript syntax, but we've got, so we've got the strict types of TypeScript, and then we've got stuff which looks and feels a bit like assembly. Um, so what's going on here is we have a single main function, which is the entry point. And um, what you see with this, this switch here and uh, these, these sort of uh, hexadecimal strings, this is a simplified version of ABI. So we've manually implemented this. The um, main function receives, uh, receives a call, and um, it sort of unpacks the first few bytes and uses that to figure out which function is being called. And I think I have the do balance function over here, which is the one that returns the current balance. And you see things which are basically more or less map one-to-one -to, -one to EVM uh, operations, right? So things like get call data size, call data copy. Uh, we're also manually managing memory. We're loading, um, 
things into pointers and stuff. I think I have another one here. This is the do transfer function. So again, this kind of um, reads the input data, gets the length of it, reads the input data, and allocates memory, you know, moves pointers around, et cetera. And then there's no return, because what has to happen is it has to store um, the return value into a pointer. So this is a step in the right direction, but this is not exactly the way I want to write code. And so I want to show you this is what it will look like. And um, this should look and feel a lot more like JavaScript, like modern JavaScript. Um, we have you know, some abstracted classes, things like a contract. We have decorators. So we use an eWASM decorator to indicate that this class is the class that um, is the entry point in this code. Uh, we use a simple store decorator. So this it looks and feels a little bit more like Solidity. It's inspired by Solidity. We have things like maps. Uh, and look how much less code this is. Look how much more readable this is, right? Get balance, set balance, or a single line. The transfer code should be pretty, pretty clear. So this is the direction we're going. The first part here, uh, as I said, this works. This compiles. Uh, this code is, is in that WRC20 examples um, directory that I showed you a moment ago. This is like halfway there. Um, I've been working on this myself uh, and could definitely use help. So this is under the uh, ethertS organization on GitHub, github.com slash etherts, um, ts being TypeScript. We're trying to build out some more TypeScript tooling. Um, yeah, I was going to do a quick live demo of, of showing you how easy it is to, um, to initialize this. You, can, you just install a single NPM module, you run a single command, and you've got the framework. But I, I think we're running short on time. So let's go on to our next talk. Thank you. So up next, we have Pavel. So Pavel um, is a member of the EWASM team. He's also on the Alith team. And he's going to talk to you about EVMC. Mm, hello. Does it work already? Yeah, OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm C++ developer within Ethereum Foundation. And one of the projects I was working uh, for some time is called EVMC. It's. Uh, uh, I would try to explain what is it and give some uh, quick updates what's, what has happened in the project recently. And um, and well, skipped a lot. <laughs> OK, here we go. Um, and the, in the second part of this presentation, I'd like to uh, go uh, go from this EVMC and through EVM as well. Um, go back to EWASM and some uh, explain some design decisions we made and where they come from. Um, well, sorry that. Okay, so let's start with this EVMC. Um, this is a project that has mostly one goal, and it wants to define the API in the classical sense uh, of the way the v EVM implementation can communicate with the full Ethereum client, and how we call it here, uh, we, call it, we call it a host. So it describes uh, just the functions the both sides of this equation has to implement. Mm. So on the host side, we we require some some functions, some methods the the client has to provide to the um, EVM execution. And uh, on the VM side, we just define what what are the entry points for execution and how the VM should be created and how it can be used by uh, Ethereum client implementations. And if we can focus on the, the host methods that are there, um, there are 12 of them. And uh, most of, the, most of this, these basic definitions are written in, in C code. However, I decided to, to show you an uh, example of what's, how the, this, this method looks like, uh, taking the Go part of, of the project. You don't, uh, you don't uh, need to read it all. It's mostly 
I wanted to show how, how complex it is to, to enable this EVM support in, in uh, Ethereum client implementation. And uh, so, uh, So uh, to explain where uh, where Iwasm is is all this picture. So uh, it's not so. I mean, it's, it seems it's completely different execution engine, but uh, EVMC actually doesn't care about the execution itself. It defines what actually data has to be provided to the execution. So uh, this project was started more or less uh, the same time the Iwasm idea was. Uh, was brought up to the Ethereum community, but it wasn't. It, it didn't have uh, didn't have the the Wasm in mind. But it it it, it turned out it's uh, you can also implement Wasm execution engine and is, use exactly the same API to bring Wasm to Ethereum clients. And here is one of the examples that actually support uh, EVMC from the beginning, and it's. Uh, Fully compatible with any Ethereum client that that actually has also the EVM support uh, in the back. Mm. So within this EVMC uh, project, they also try to uh, have language bindings uh, directly inside the project, and we started. Uh, well, the first one was the Python prototype of of. Of that to figure out if Python, Python being scripting language, uh, is it is it the the C API is good enough to have Python uh, Python support and that worked uh, very well, uh, but now we have Go support uh, ready to be used and Geth is using that uh, uh, does uh, Go bindings uh, in the in the Go Ethereum project. And, and I hope there will be more, uh, uh, but mostly uh, I try to keep them inside the project to be tested with all the changes we made in there. And just before Bef uh, DEF CON, there was a release 6.0.0 uh, of, uh, of EVMC. Um, we're using semantic versioning for that. And also, um, we describe a number called ABI version, which is the first number of the full version. And this number is exposed to the, to the implementation to check for basic compatibility, uh, especially we, when we use uh, dynamic loaded libraries uh, for deployment. And at the current moment, uh, I'll have the C++ implementation of, of, of Ethereum client and GEF within the pull request that was submitted supports EVMC. And on the EVM side, uh, we have Aleph interpreter, which is part of Aleph project, and also Hira that supports that uh, currently. And there is, there is a node that actually uses this GEF plus Aleph interpreter combination that it's fully uh, production ready uh, and can be used on the mainnet. I have one node running myself. And we, we're using GEF and uh, Hira combination uh, uh, to run the Iwasm testnet. And some of the plans, but I changed it to wishes because there's no commitment to that. It kind of works in the... Uh, reactive way, so if, if you would like to have uh, to bring this support to your projects or you need some other language bindings, uh, please express this, uh, this needs and we're happy to help. And this is uh, like where you, when you, can, you can learn more about the project, where you can find documentation. There are uh, implementation guides both for VM side and for host side, some examples and chat room when we are available. <clears throat> so from that, uh, I would like to go to the second part of the talk and uh, spend very little time on explaining 
uh, how this affects EWASM design to some sense. Um, so I'd like to, to put your attention on three, three aspects of starting with EVM. There are this kind of special opcodes there uh, that annoys many people, but uh, <coughs> uh, and how they map, and I would like to explain how they map to EVMC design and both uh, the EWASM design. So these special instructions, I mean, are uh, some, some, some instructions that allows you from the, con from the contract execution to access Ethereum state and some other environment information about what's going on currently on the blockchain. So you are allowed to put some data in this database called, called storage, read data from there, and check the balances of other accounts and many other things. And just for, for this example, I will focus on this S-load and S-store. <coughs> and so because this is this storage access is it's required for, for contract execution, but it's not about the execution itself. It's a way to access some data that is outside of this uh, virtual machine that it's, it's conducting execution. So for, exa for example, in EVS, EVMC uh, design, we have to provide that. So this is like one of the required methods the host has to implement to allow contracts to access that. And we cannot provide this this uh, this data up front because that would be I mean we, we we don't know which exactly portion of data would be needed for execution. Mm. So this is this is also taken from Go bindings uh, of EVMC, and this is there are two functions that this host class has to uh, <coughs> has to provide uh, for for VMs. And, we, and when we go to uh, EWASM and precisely to this uh, Ethereum interf uh, environment interface, this is a part of EWASM that tries to describe very similar uh, aspect of that. So how code written in WebAssembly can access uh, environment and information that are specific to Ethereum. Mm, so here, uh, this is a snippet of uh, WebAssembly text representation, and mostly what it shows, it's, uh, first of all, this notion of important functions in, uh, in WebAssembly. So this, these are functions that, given uh, WebAssembly binary, uh, specify are required for execution. So uh, every, uh, every contract, WebAssembly written contract, Will need will have a set of these, and probably will specify that okay, I need this uh, this functions provided by by the the environment I'm running it to access some uh, Ethereum specific information. <coughs> and to learn ab more about that, there is a section if in the design design repo. Of, uh, of EWASM. So I encourage you to, to check out all other methods that are there and maybe leave some comments if you think we can do better. I mean, most of them map more or less directly to EVM semantics because, I mean, there's many reasons for that. But one of them was to have full compatibility with EVM. Um, that is now uh, questionable if we want it or not, but if you have opinion about that, uh, yeah, this is the place you can, can find more information. Okay, that's all for me. Uh, thanks for attention. Thank you, Pa. Okay, thank you, Pavel. That was great. Um, most of you don't know. Does it, does it work? Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, most of you don't know that without EVMC, we wouldn't have been able to enable the testnet on both Aleph and Geth. So it's a really important project. Uh, please check the repo uh, Pavel has shown. 
Um, it is the way to, to get rapid support for your Wasm in any new client. Um, and now, the, the most important, you want to load the video? The most important part is the testnet. Um, so we have Jared. Hello. Welcome, Jared. Jared, use this mic. So Jared started working on Ethereum JS. He did a lot of the VM work at Ethereum JS, and then he also did a lot of work in Rust on, on the Wasm team, and he's also working on uh, POA stuff, proof of authority stuff in Rust. Um, but in the last couple of months, he has focused a lot on the DevOps side on Ewasm. Um, so it's really due to Jared and Casey, the dev DevOps team at Ewasm, that we have a testnet. Um, just one last note about the testnet itself. Um, it is actually working. It has been working. Uh, for the last couple of months. Um, but this is the first time we shared it with you guys. Uh, but keep in mind that we are still making changes to it. We are making updates to it. Uh, it is a proof of work testnet. Um, so we are going to just reboot it with the new updates every now and then. Um, but it's, still, it's already ready to be used. Um, so big applause for Jared again. And he's going to explain everything to you guys. Cool. Uh, is this working? Yeah, it is. Uh, Thanks for the introduction, Alex. Hi, everybody. Uh, I prepared a short video because, well, we know how live demos go. Uh, so let's, and it doesn't have sound, so I'll just kind of um, guide you guys through. Stay so, the mic. Ah, yeah. yeah, so what we're seeing here is um, just the basic components of a test net. I've created an empty account. Uh, I am connecting to the RPC endpoint and getting some ether. And now we wait a little bit. Okay, so the next step, uh, I'm going to deploy a contract I have here. And this is actually a contract from our test suite. And basically, all this does is it just, it's some deployment code to to put up a simple WebAssembly contract. Um, and this is a simple tool we've developed um, that should make deploying contracts uh, fairly easy. Um, so yeah, um, one of the things that you should note about this is that you'll see that at no point um, before deploying, there, well, actually, I'll just let it be deployed and then explain. <laughs> Cool, okay. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, this highlights a little um, bug that recently appeared in our Explorer. Uh, don't worry, we're going to hot fix it. Uh, but you're going to watch me uh, scroll through the list of all accounts to find my deployed contract. Um, and I guess one of the things that I want to highlight here, uh, once, I, <laughs> once I scroll through all the pages, but so uh, it, I, if you, if, when you saw earlier presentations, you may have heard about metering. Uh, and so if you saw the contract code I had de uh, deployed before, uh, you'll notice that there were no uh, metering or use gas calls. Uh, and what's going to happen is that when I've deployed this contract, actually uh, what's going on is we have another contract called the Sentinel contract, which is going to take my deployed contract, parse it out, and apply metering injection to it. So. Uh, after I finished scrolling through some pages here, don't worry, this will be hot fixed. It's <laughs> should be one. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is a little. Uh, this is the block explorer that we've modified. Uh, now, if you 
can see uh, the code now has this use gas import and the entire uh, branch has been uh, metered by, I'm just gonna pause it real quick. So this, if you'll see the, the use gas statement is was applied by the metering contract, it's applied to the entire branch um, and I believe metering as it currently works is applied by branch, so. I can't tell you much more than that because my job mostly involves uh, breaking things on the test net and then fixing them. Uh, I didn't actually write the metering contract, so. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's kinda, that's kinda it for the demo. Um, please feel free to go up. I mean, it's up now, uh, so go and uh, try and break our, break our stuff. Uh, uh, we are going to be releasing t later today uh, some instructions if you want to connect your own node to the testnet so you don't necessarily have to use our tooling. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the demo. Thank you, Jared, for the demo. Um, yeah, we're really excited to, to share the testnet. It's live, as he said. The RPC URL, I think, is just ewasm.ethereum.org port 8545. So you can actually plug that into MetaMask. You can plug that into your browser. You can get testnet ether already. Um, there are instructions up in the ewasm slash testnet repository about connecting your own node, but I think it doesn't include the latest like Genesis file. So you probably, if you were to try to do that right now, you'd get an error. Sorry, Aviv and other people in the room who've already tried to do that. We'll, we'll update that later today. So cool, we're going to move into a Q&A. Uh, for five or ten minutes so we can have all the teammates come up and we'll answer questions. Uh, ZX, are you good to go with the mic? Excellent. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do a short break and then come back for the second half of the breakout. So if you have a question, raise your hand about anything you've seen. I have a question about this EVMC. Uh, you mentioned that it's running on one mainnet node. Uh, what does it mean for me as a, like, can I run Evosm code on the mainnet if you pick up my transaction in minor block, or like what does it mean? Um, so it's just basic Ethereum node. Uh, if you go to etherstats.net, there's one node called Aleph Interpreter. So it's combination with, with the get client and Aleph Interpreter as a VM implementation. So that's it. You, you just, if, if you want to run your own node, you can just use this. this implementation. Hey, thanks for the talks. Uh, from your experience, like the, you have mentioned several languages, Solidity, VASM, uh, Assembly Script, C++, which one is like a better or worse in case of like a using, like having several languages is good in one like direction, but also there might be some problems connecting with like a using one language or possible, I don't know, some drawbacks. Could you share like uh, your experience when you were actually trying to use different languages for the same thing? Yeah, I'll just repeat the question first. Um, so the question, if I understand correctly, is that we just uh, explained that one of the benefits of eWASM and WASM is that it allows us to write contracts in many languages. You saw demos of two of them right now. And so share your experiences, you know, which ones have been working better, which have not been working so well, are there sort of uh, advantages or drawbacks to any of them? Anyone want to take that question? Uh, I'm just going to put it out. Obviously, Solidity is the best <laughs> to write contracts in. Uh, but that's for the fact that you guys are familiar with Solidity. And you can take all the ex existing code and compile it to WASM once we get that done, but it's not done yet. Um, so right now, the, the next best thing probably is Rust, uh, if you know Rust. Uh, but it does have a steep learning curve. Um, but it has the most mature tooling around it. And even our tooling around it is the most mature one. Um, if you feel extremely confident, you could try C++ or C. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it personally. Um, we do need a lot of help to finish assembly script. Um, so probably I, I would try to direct you know, all the effort into that direction, uh, unless you want to work on Solidity compiler to have UWASM. So these are like the two main directions to, to enable contracts, easy contract writing to people. Yeah, forget about the Go. Um, we should do an introduction here, though, if, yeah. if you want to ask proper questions. Um, In case you want to start, we'll just go down the line. Um, yeah, 
doesn't have a mic. You just rotate. You want to rotate around? Yeah, I'm Casey, and uh, just to answer the question, I think one of the advantages of WebAssembly um, is the interoperability between different languages. So you can take a library that was, you know, that's in Rust, compile it down to WebAssembly, then you can call that from an, 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 some assembly script code. Uh, so being able to mix these different high-level languages, I think, is a um, good advantage. Hugo. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hugo. Uh, I'm working uh, mostly on writing test cases using the WebAssembly text format, which is really, really fun. <laughs> and yeah, helping a little bit on the on the EWAS and Explorer as well. Uh, hi, my name is Guillaume. I'm a member of the Go team and also uh, of EWASM, obviously. Uh, yes, so uh, just to uh, wanted to say, um, when it comes to Go, Go has a very uh, limited support of, uh, well, very experimental support of uh, WebAssembly. So, and it's got all those features that you don't need in the case of uh, WebAssembly, like the garbage collector, all that stuff. So, uh, the like the binaries you get are very, very big, and it's really not appropriate for for this kind of uh, use case so far. Uh, but have you seen that there is a embedded compiler for Go, which also supports Wasm output, and throws out the GC, and it's Through kind Wasm of tiny. GC? Um, no, it throws out the GC of Go, so it's tiny. Yeah, okay. Well, if they, um, that would be interesting. No, I didn't know. Uh, it would be interesting to to have a look at it. Still, don't think it's a great language for that. But yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Alex kind of already gave the spiel on me. Um, yeah. Uh, Jared, part of the eWASM team. Uh, I've also, uh, in addition to working on DevOps, uh, I have written a few adapters for bringing uh, DNSSEC, more cryptography for DNSSEC, specifically ED25519, um, to the, uh, as a precompile through eWASM. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, well, you know me, I had the talk, uh, so just pass it on to Lane. I'm Lane. Um, I have been working on tests with Hugo. I've been working on the assembly script, which you already saw, and then kind of things like documentation and, I don't know, education, let's call it, like trying to organize events and get people excited about you. Awesome. Community! Yeah. <laughs> writing. Thank you, Boris. Okay. Writing, writing code is easy. Building communities is hard. So community, FTW. I'm Pavo, and... Yeah, I'm C++ dev. Maybe we just go back to questions. Well, Paul, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, one more. Uh, Paul, trained in math. Uh, I just do some basic stuff that helps everyone out. Paul's very, Paul's very modest, but uh, he's the cornerstone of the team. Thanks. Paul was very instrumental on, the, on helping us get the benchmarking set up. It's way over my head, so thank you, Paul. All right, um, do we have any more? Sorry. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, I thought this uh, assembly script demo was fucking awesome. Uh, so, like, what what uh, work is left to sort of get assembly script um, to a, um, a a good level? And, uh, like, so this is my first time sort of learning a lot about, like, WASM and eWASM. So, like, what steps uh, are there left to, you know, write a contract and assembly script and be able to deploy it on the current... Uh, Ethereum mainnet. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you're as excited about assembly script as I am. I mean, I really, I said this before, I'll say it again. I really think that this is a, a platform that we can use to get like millions of people excited about Ethereum who may not be excited about Solidity. All due respect to Solidity. <laughs> uh, so, I didn't have a chance to talk about this. So, assembly script is a, obviously an open source project. Uh, there's a small team working on it. It's kind of a beta, I would say. So it, it works, but it's volatile. So th they make breaking changes sometimes, which has sort of slowed things a little bit. Um, what I've done is I've, so they have a, they have a compiler um, that takes the WebAssembly, sorry, the assembly script that you saw and, and runs it through under the hood something called Binarian, which is actually a, a C-based assembly script compiler and then produces the assembly script code, sorry, the WASM code, the WebAssembly code. Um, so what I've done is I've hooked into their compiler uh, through what's called a transform step. So if you know anything about the way compilers work, you have, um, you have a tokenized step, and you have, a, you have parsing and tokenizing, and then you have a compilation step. And then, so in between those two, they, they, it hands us the AST, which is the abstract syntax tree, and we can kind of move things around. 
right? So for example, there were decorators like that at uwasm decorator. So in the transform step, we can grab that and we can um, then insert things like the init code that we need into the tree, and then that gets passed back to the assembly script compiler, and that gets compiled down to WASM code. So that's just a high-level overview of how this works. Um, so that's all working. It's just all these pieces, right? So getting storage working, getting the init code working, and then the other piece that needs to be done is hooking into tools like Embark and Truffle, so that you can easily deploy those things onto the chain. So I would say the work is about 50% complete. There's still a lot to do. And as I said, I've been doing this alone and you know, working on other things at the same time. So if anyone in this room is excited about this, um, yeah, so just check out the repository. It's github.com slash etherts slash ewasm-as. I'll put that on the screen or something, ewasm-assembly script. So the second part of your question, which is kind of like, how far are we away from being able to actually write contracts actually in assembly script and actually deploy them on the main net? Uh, that basically is a question about the EWASM roadmap. I don't know. You touched upon this, Alex. Do you want to talk about how this might go to mainnet? Yeah, I don't think I have much more to say to that. <laughs> when it goes to the mainnet, um, so it definitely can be used on the testnet. Uh, and regarding the mainnet, we, we definitely uh, have the goal to have all of this on the mainnet. Uh, but that, that's going to take a while. Um, we do believe that we can accelerate that process by first proposing just a subset. Uh, of EWASM for the mainnet, and that will be only for pcompiles. Um, so that's one of the next things we're trying to, um, to discuss with other teams, how we could do that. Uh, we brought that up on one of those all core dev calls, and, and there was a good reception to it. Um, so I think we're going we're gonna to achieve like pcompile support on the mainnet for WASM next year sometime, perhaps. Uh, it also depends on how Constantinople goes, right? <laughs> that's a big question. Um, and after that, um, hopefully, you can expand into full, full mainnet support. Um, but you guys can already try it on a testnet. And that's what matters right now. And we have been closely in touch with other projects, including Parity, Polkadot. Um, uh, uh, Space Mesh is another example of a project that's really excited about, um, about eWASM and about things like AssemblyScript. So I mean, none of these are like in production yet. But the code that you write now and the things you learn now will apply actually across like a, a whole host of different chains in the future. Do we have time for more? Um, yeah, I guess for one more question. Yeah, what, what would it take to get past maybe a year, a while, a while, to an actual schedule, um, allocated resources, a series of tasks, the kind of thing I would expect to see in a real engineering project so that other engineering projects can plan their work and have some degree of confidence that if they spend their thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, um, that they won't find out that, oh, no, not this year, next year, oh, no, not next year, the year after that. Um, you know, what would it take to get a much higher level of confidence in your scheduling rather than what appears to be guesswork. Uh, you're asking a question about confidence. Uh, yeah, how, how can we get more than, here's a roadmap, and maybe we'll get there someday, versus here's a schedule with assigned resources and a fairly high degree of confidence that we will get to certain stages. We're not business people. We're engineers. We're developers. Uh, we, you know, to define what confidence means, you have to define what a human being is and how human beings interact with each other, and I don't even know what that means. I'm just a developer. I don't know. Well, then where's, where are the managers? So if, okay. this, can this I, this uh, is how, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've, Alex, go ahead. I've spent years in. Beyond the scope of the EWASM team, right? That's kind of a question partially for the foundation, and not only the foundation, but the ecosystem as a whole, right? I mean, OK, I, I do think we have, we have some kind of answers to this question, and I'm glad you asked this question. Um, so in the EWASM team itself, we do. Uh, started to use in the last couple of months uh, the, the project boards on GitHub and set up projects and goals and deadlines for those. Uh, and we do have all of that mapped out for the, the tiny tools we have, for example, Hera, which Pavel has mentioned. We have a roadmap, when, which version, with what features set are going to be released. Um, so I, I think we're really improving in the Yuasm project itself to have a proper roadmap and, and, and plans for those. Uh, but the bigger question is really how we can apply all of this to the mainnet. Um, and the good news, I think, is that there, recently there have been a lot of good discussions between uh, all the different teams involved with writing mainnet clients. 
And, and it seems like all these teams are interested in, in improving the process, the non-existing process, uh, putting something in place of that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that this is going to happen very soon. Um, the first step has been made. All these teams started to communicate to each other and realize that there is an issue which has to be fixed. Um, so I think it's going to become better. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I think, are we out of time for questions? Um, yeah, I mean, the question is, are you guys tired? Do you want to take a break? Or do you want to make questions? Because we still have like another hour to, to go. And uh, can you give them a glimpse of what's coming up in the next hour? Yeah, what so sort we, of topics? I think roughly we have like 40 minutes of content left. Um, we're going to start, which is the Wasm engines is the first, right? Yeah, the Wasm engine. So, so Paul going to deep dive into how Wasm actually works and how Wasm engines work. That's super exciting. Um, then we have two uh, visions and how we could, well, actually three visions. The first vision is uh, called Turbo eWASM, which uh, explores ideas how we could speed up uh, transaction processing speed and, and increase the throughput, uh, which applies to eWASM, but also applies to EVM on the mainnet. Um, so that's super exciting. And then we have a really grand vision for the future uh, titled eWASM OS. Uh, which tries to pull everything together, what I mentioned in the very first part of the talk, as Web 2.5 versus Web 3, to have like this combined uh, seamless system. So that's the WasmOS talk. And then we have a really big topic on how to do Shasper in a different way. Um, so that's like 40 minutes, uh, and we have one hour left, like 55 minutes. Uh, anybody want to take a break? <laughs>